Um, yeah, I guess we get started. So, um, welcome to our Backstage Maintainer Track Talk, uh, the state of Backstage in 2024. Uh, we can do some introductions first. My name is Ben. I am a senior engineer at Spotify uh, and a core maintainer at Backstage. Been working at Spotify for like five years nearly, and four of them on Backstage. And I'm with Patrick. Hello, my name is Patrick. Go by Rugby on GitHub. Also senior engineer, core maintainer, and those other things. Yes. Q. All right. So let's dive into an agenda. So we are today going to be looking at uh, project updates. Um, yeah, we're going to dive into some updates around the project, what's going on. Uh, we're going to touch on some governance updates that we've been working on, um, project areas from things that sort of, well, project areas that's happening inside Backstage. Going to stop around some of those and do some updates there too. Um, and then we're going to dive into some core framework things that we've been working on. So, first off, project updates. So, Backstage has been around in some shape or form within Spotify for the better part of like eight years. Uh, our developer portal journey, I guess you could say, was first spreadsheets, and then we kind of moved into this uh, developer portal journey for a single pane of glass, and then that's kind of turned into what is now called Backstage. So just over four years ago, me, Patrick, Freben, uh, and some other people from Spotify got together in a hack week to see if we could open source our developer portal. And on the 15th of March in uh, 2020, we released Backstage Framework to the world and open sourced it, which makes last week its fourth birthday. Woo! Yeah. Great. Um, a quick numbers update too. So these numbers are taken from KubeCon in Chicago when we were all eating deep dish pizza. Um, so it's basically like the last four months. So we have grown it up to 10%. Contributions are up 15%. So that's showing some good progress and good growth in projects overall. All right, next are some updates for what we've been doing for project governance. Uh, there are no big changes this time around, but uh, just some additions to our process. So what we've recently added are Backstage Enhancement Proposals, or BEPs. Uh, this is a new process for suggesting, iterating, and approving the design of new features for Backstage. It's, of course, heavily inspired by Kubernetes Enhancement Proposals, uh, but it's a bit more lightweight. Uh, un up until this introduction uh, of BEPs, our main tools for iterating on design were GitHub issues and pull requests. Both of those are fine when the scope is uh, fairly limited, but for larger proposals with more complicated designs and harder decision, it gets a lot trickier. In particular, it's really hard to collaborate on a design in something like a GitHub issue where you might have multiple different uh, discussion threads going on at the same time and not an always up-to-date proposal to refer to. So what we've added now uh, is the web process to close this gap. Uh, it's going to make it easier for both for all of you to contribute and drive design. And we also think it will help us arrive at more well thought uh, out the side, uh, design with clear ownership uh, and path to implementation. So let's take a quick look at the happy path uh, for a BEP. It starts as an idea for a new feature in, of some form. Uh, it can often be good to circulate this idea on Discord, uh, in the community Discord, or in a SIG meeting, just to gauge interest uh, before starting a proposal. Assuming you want to move it forward, uh, the next step is the initial creation of the BEP. At this stage, this uh, proposal can be very lightweight. The most important parts are motivation and goals for the design. You open up a pull request to create the BEP and then have it approved by the uh, owning project area. If it gets approved and merged, uh, there is a, that is a commitment by the owners of the area that they want the work to be done and have the capacity to facilitate the contribution. However, it does not mean that the owners will build it, and it is not yet the approval of the design itself. This initial approval uh, and commitment to facilitating the contribution is something that was really completely missing in our uh, old process for managing contributions. Next up is the iteration phase. Uh, this is where the proposal is worked on until it is ready to be implemented. Throughout this process, anyone is really free to contribute uh, and or open up uh, pull requests to suggest changes to the proposal. And it's up to the owners uh, of the area to approve or reject the proposal, uh, the, the updates. Uh, and this is where you start digging into the nitty-gritty details and figure out the, you know, what, what the proposal is about, how it's supposed to be implemented and rolled out. It can often make sense as well to have an experimental implementation at this point, just to help to get things uh, a bit more concrete. Finally, once the proposal is settled and has a good rollout, rollout plan and an owner uh, of the implementation, it is marked as implementable. Uh, this is a sign-off by the project area owners that they are happy with the proposal and want to see it implemented. The BEP is then used as a guide when reviewing each pull request towards the implementation. 
This lets us speed up reviews by having a clear target design while still being able to split things into smaller uh, chunks that are easier to review. If there are new discoveries uh, that require changes to the design, uh, the BEP should be updated to reflect those. Although once the BEP is fully implemented, it's frozen and no longer updated. It becomes a historical document, and that is a snapshot of design at that time. If there are further changes needed to the feature, that would be a separate proposal, a new BEP. All right, uh, that's all I wanted to say about the BEP process. And now over to Ben for some project area updates. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so let's look at some. Um, well, let's look at what's been going on in some of the project areas in Backstage. So. There's a new project area for notifications, which is maintained by Marek from Red Hat, with some major contributions from Heike from OP Group. Uh, this area owns the new notification system uh, that's currently in development, uh, where the goal is to be able to send notifications to users. Um, we're also happy to say that we've, uh, fin well, we've started the work setting up a new community plugins repository, um, and this is led by the community plugins project area with Andre, Beth, Nick, Philip, Thomas, and Vincenzo as maintainers. So let's dive into the community plugins project area and see what's going on there. So some of you might remember uh, our talk from Chicago and remember this slide. So this was um, an RFC uh, that we submitted about pausing the acceptance of new plugins into the backstage monorepo um, and some options for what we can do instead. So in developer portals using backstage, uh, plugins play a pivotal role. Uh, they use the backstage framework to provide different functionalities to your developer portal and giving developers the tools that they need to work efficiently. So there's plugins for Kubernetes, Catalog, Scaffolder, TechDocs, and then there's nearly like 100 other repos in the Backstage Monorepo repo itself. Um, uh, sorry, 100 other plugins in the Backstage community repo, uh, in the Backstage repo. Um, so the discussions in this RFC suggested an, and refined an idea for us to have a community plugins repository underneath the Backstage organization, which acts as the designated home for all these community contributed plugins for Backstage. And with Red Hat wanting to join forces to set up this repo, that's the path that we settled on. So I want to wind back a little bit and talk about why we even need a community plugins repository. So let's recap the discussions from the RFC. So we want to make it easy for plugin owners to contribute plugins, as well as having other tooling around publishing and releasing, which puts plugin owners in charge rather than it being coupled to the backstage core releases that happen weekly or monthly for mainline. Another thing we also noticed is that plugins published in separate repositories sometimes can become stagnant and then unmaintained over time. And this is all fine and kind of common in a healthy open source uh, software ecosystem. Um, but we also noticed that there's also sometimes other users ready to contribute and want to help maintain these plugins. So having all these in a common repository is a good way where we can get people to come together and share the maintenance for these plugins. It's also going to help us as core maintainers to focus on the core of the project without having this cognitive load of all these community plugins and having to maintain them also. Instead, there's going to be designated community plugin repo maintainers, as well as plugin maintainers working on that repo to help support triage, reviews, all that kind of stuff. So what's the scope of the project area? What are they doing and where are we at? So obviously, as I just mentioned, the project area is going to be in charge of setting up this repo getting all the tooling in place, and then moving the plugins across into the community plugins repo. We've already started moving some plugins across, so expect a big bang of releases for, uh, and plugins to be moved across shortly. Um, we're also going to be changing the scope of the NPM packages too, so they're likely going to be using the backstage community scope uh, instead. But of course, this is going to be a migration. We want to make this super simple and kind of transparent, so we're going to be updating a lot of the tooling that we've got to kind of do this for you. Um, and we expect that the core, oh, sorry, all of the core plugins, the framework, uh, and potentially some of the accompanying modules, we will expect will stay in the main monorepo for now. So this is an exciting step, store, step forward in scaling the project and keeping things moving in the right direction. Oops. One second. It's a lot of talking. Cheers. Okay. Open API. So this is a project area um, uh, with Aramis. I think he is here. Wave your hand somewhere. Yeah, there there is. Um, and he's making some great progress here uh, with integrating OpenAPI uh, tooling into Backstage. So we've now got the ability to generate type routers uh, from OpenAPI schemas. So basically, OpenAPI YAML, for anybody that's used OpenAPI before, you can 
uh, basically generate a typed express router for you to implement in your uh, backstage backend plugin. Uh, we've also now got the ability to generate type clients too. So from those same schemas, uh, you can generate TypeScript clients or whatever client you like. Um, and this is also going to be very useful for creating and packaging clients for integration with those same backend plugins. And it's in use today in the catalog client package. We use this. Uh, and there's also some experimental optic support for schema aware testing. Uh, so Aramis has got some open PRs right now, uh, which enable things like fuzzy testing, um, automatic detection of like breaking API changes too. Um, there was a talk that he did yesterday at BackstageCon. Go watch it. Great. Uh, that explains this a lot better than what I can. Uh, yes. Uh, so yeah, really excited to see what's going on here and uh, rolling out some more schema first open API stuff. Scaffolder updates. Yes. Um, so this is a project area we also announced in November in Chicago. Uh, with help from Bogdan from uh, Bol.com. Uh, for people that don't know what the scaffolder is, it's uh, a collection of plugins and modules which power the create flows in backstage, sometimes called software templates, if you're familiar with that. Um, we've been having regular sync meetings um, and going through the open issues in private, uh, but recently we moved that work out into the open uh, in the form of a SIG so that we can have regular meetings with the community, project area maintainers, core maintainers, and going through all the things that's happening with the scaffolder. Uh, Bogdan has also been driving some work around retries of steps. Uh, so if, for instance, a step fails or the task dies, uh, it's going to pick it up and resume from a previously known good state. Uh, closely related to that too is rollbacks. So being able to undo things like yeah, the steps, like the creation of the GitHub repositories, undo that rollback and start from a clean slate. Uh, this work is kind of under a lot of planning right now. Don't really know where it's going to land, uh, but super excited to see what's next there. Uh, and there's also some new scaffolder actions, uh, test utils for scaffolder actions, sorry, um, which will allow you to create a test harness for testing these actions a little bit easier rather than having to mock out some of our internal types like the context and things like that. Um, and, also some final, and also finally some improved support for secrets in the scaffolder. So the secret field extension is now going to make sure that the secrets that you collect from users in the form, um, they're going to be properly protected and redacted in logs. So if you're dealing with anything sensitive, please make sure to go check these stuff out. And the last update from me is on the microsite and documentation. Um, the CNCF kind of funded a documentation review uh, for the Backstage I.O. microsite. Uh, we found some areas for improvement and how we can make these docs more user-friendly. Um, always good to get a fresh set of eyes on documentation in a project that you spend every minute of your working career in, because <laughs> you can kind of get lost amongst the weeds, I guess. Um, there's a collection of issues underneath this uh, umbrella issue here um, that's come out the back of the review. Some big ones, some smaller ones, some rewrites, some restructuring. Um, and contributions in open source is not always code, right? So if you want to please, go, if you want to go and help contribute and help us fix the docs, then please reach out. Yes. All right. Uh, let's round off the project area updates um, to, with a look at what Marek and Heike have been uh, working on in the notifications project area. So the current uh, scope is uh, rich in app user notifications, but we're also preparing to support uh, notifications routed through external uh, channels uh, in the future as well. Uh, the notifications area also owns the Signals plugin, which is an underlying piece of infrastructure that lets plugins push lightweight signals to subscribers in the front end, uh, which can be useful in some other places too. So I'm going to jump over to a demo. There we go. So here we have a very lightweight backstage app, uh, no content, basically. I'm going to show you a notification. So keep your eyes uh, on the notification sidebar item there to the left. And I'm going to send a request to the notifications backend with a little payload. And there we go. We got a badge indicating that we have a new notification coming in. Uh, hello, KubeCon. Can mark this red. Move on. Now, we also mentioned signals. Uh, we have the DevTools backend here, which just shows information about the um, instance running uh, backstage, uh, which in this case in, is my laptop. And you can see here that we have live updates uh, of the memory usage and load, which is a signal uh, that you subscribe to when you're on this page. All right, that was a quick demo. Back to the presentation. Yes, sweet. Um, now, again, this is all work done by uh, Heike and uh, Marit. Uh, in the notifications project area. 
I also want to give a shout out to Patrick Jungermann from Boniel uh, and his work on the event system, uh, which the notifications rely on. Okay, now I want to switch gears and focus on the core framework changes uh, that we have been working on. Starting off, uh, something that we're currently working on are improvements to the auth system. And this is not about user authentication, but rather how communication with the backend is secured. Our main goal for this work has been to make Backstage secure by default, to no longer have this requirement to deploy Backstage behind something like a VPN. It's too common of a mistake to deploy Backstage unprotected, and it's something that we just wanted to remove as a problem. Uh, another benefit is, of course, that you remove this external dependency to make Backstage easier to set up. While at it, we also wanted to simplify and improve our service-to-service -service authentication, moving to a better distributed solution that doesn't require management of static secrets. And finally, we wanted to improve uh, handling of our user tokens, uh, avoiding the pattern of forwarding user tokens for service calls and instead using uh, service credentials on behalf of users uh, with a reduced scope. Now, I'm not going to dive into how we solved all of that in this talk. Uh, we did a lightning talk on the topic yesterday, though, so I'd encourage you to go watch the recording of that if you didn't catch it. If you want to dig into uh, more details, you can also have a look at BEP number three, which uh, covers all of the API design uh, of this new uh, improvement. Now, this is all something that we're still working on uh, and rolling out. Yesterday, we released uh, 1.24, uh, which included all of the API changes we needed for this uh, overall uh, improvement. And then we're targeting uh, uh, 1.25, the next release in a month, uh, where we ship the underlying improvements for the service uh, and user auth. Now, most of these changes only apply to the new backend system, which means that if you haven't migrated yet, uh, this is another reason to do so. Lastly, uh, we're following all of this up with a security audit sponsored by the CNCF, just to double check our work and for your peace of mind. Okay, that was it for features, and I'm going to switch over to talk about the framework itself, uh, the part of Backstage that glues everything together. First, let me remind you uh, of our overarching goal for the last year or so, which is declarative integration. Uh, we want to move away from using TypeScript to integrate plugins, allow you to set up and manage a Backstage instance without the need to write any code. We shift much of the responsibility out towards plugins, and we make it more uh, clear how plugins are supposed to communicate with each other as well. Now, we're working on this for both the front-end and back-end systems, although we treat those as separate efforts. Starting out with a new front-end system, uh, we did a full talk on this in KubeCon NA last year in Chicago, and we'd encourage you to check out this talk if you want more details. Uh, in that talk, we promised an alpha release at the end of last year, uh, which we delivered in our 121 release. With that release, you're able to build a fully working backstage app with the new system, but it's still a early version with plenty of work left to do. And at this stage, you should not be using this in your, in your own project unless you want to be on the bleeding edge. Now, looking forward, we have identified, if it identified a few critical areas for improvement, uh, which came out of feedback from our own usage uh, internally at Spotify. In particular, we want to make it easier to make, uh, and make and create customizations, uh, both if you want to override existing extensions or create new extension types. We're also going to make improvements to our testing utilities, and on top of that, there's a long list of smaller improvements that we want to work through to polish the system. Now, to get to the end goal of this system being the default, the next step is to get to the second phase of roll-up, rollout. Uh, this is where we add compatibility uh, with a new system in our existing front-end system. The goal is to make it easier to have plugins seamlessly support both systems at the same time without a bunch of boilerplate compatibility code. Now, that requires confidence in our design of the new system, which is why it's important that we do these other changes first. From what we see right now, this isn't something that we're going to be able to uh, start working on until the second half of 2024. Now over to the backend system. Okay, uh, so first I want to celebrate a couple of milestones uh, from the last year. The new backend system marks, marked us ready for production, and we've already seen significant adoption. We've some, seen many of you uh, able to move to the new system early on with the help of our compatibility APIs, even if all of the plugins weren't ready yet. But there's also much less uh, of a need for that now. Uh, close to all plugins and modules in the main backstage repository have, uh, now have support for the new backend system, along with extensions for customization of those plugins. 
With the 1.24 release that went out yesterday, the new backend system is now also the new default for backstage projects. Now, the work towards our new backend system started before declarative integration, uh, the declarative integration initiative, although it was already heading in that direction. Um, but now we've properly, properly added support for declarative integration uh, in the new backend system, allowing you to integrate new backend plugins uh, without changing uh, code, which Ben is now going to give you a demo of. Keyboard is not oh, the keyboard is not right. Okay, so I'm going to prefix this uh, with the note that it looks like I fail, like can't type on all the demos that we do, <laughs> and it's because it's the Swedish keyboard. <laughs> so this is going to go one of two ways. It'll be fine, I'm sure. Okay, um, let's have a look. Oh, it's command now. Okay, command of course now. it is. And it's also Patrick's key bindings, which make it a thousand times worse. <laughs> no, it's fine. You're good. All right, let's uh, head over to the demo. Um, so, no, that's not it. This is fun. Okay, here we are. And then where's the Chrome window for this? Here we go. Look, that was easy. Fine. Right. Okay. So, um, yes, back in system demo. So. Before we dive in uh, a little bit to like the new um, declarative integration, I want to kind of take a step back. So I'm actually going to go to the code window instead here. So um, for everybody that's using Backstage already, this might kind of look familiar from uh, before. So a lot of, in this file, you see like a lot of setup code. Like there's a lot of boilerplate for creating your backend, right? A lot of it is like creating the environment to create these plugins, uh, and then obviously registering the plugins themselves into the backend. Um, there's kind of a lot of boilerplate stuff here, and this is kind of what we started this whole new backend system initiative and declarative integration to kind of fix. Because this is a lot of like manually uh, maintaining this yourself. It's not great, right? So we headed in the direction of the new backend system, which allows you to do the same code, or like this is the same functionality as the previous uh, code example, but this is a lot smaller right now. So we're just adding in the plugins um, themselves. All of that boilerplate has been moved to the framework instead. So now we set up all the dependencies for the environment, and register these plugins for you as normal. Now, there is another step for this, which is what we've just been alluding to, which is declarative integration, which is to basically, ideally, is to make this a lot smaller too. And this is the step that we're heading in. So is this too small for everybody? Can, can people see? Do you want me to make it bigger? Or is it good? It's too, I'll, I'll just make it a little tiny bit bigger. I'm gonna, there we go. Yes, risky. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is um, the new standard that we're looking at, we have a feature discovery service, which we uh, register in the back end, and then that is in charge of discovering all of the new plugins and modules and adding them to the back end for you. So arguably, this is also very standard, like there's nothing custom in here. So we could also kind of provide this for you. And if you wanted to provide your own, you could do that. Um, but yeah, this is the reason we're heading in this direction is to make set up a back end plugins, a back end much more simpler. So how does it all work? All right, let's go start. So I'm going to just uh, pop back to this terminal window here. I'm going to cancel this, and I'm going to run yarn start back. See, plus, that's not a plus, back end. There we go. So you'll see how it, when it starts the back end, here we go. You'll see how we have some new log lines, which is uh, detected these packages down here in the corner. I'll make this also a little bit bigger. Two. So you see, oops how we are detecting these plugins and modules and registering those into the back end. Now, I want to just take a quick jump back to this. Uh, if we go to the catalog here, oops, I'm just going to refresh this. I have a feeling, yes. So we have nothing in the catalog, right? So I want to show you an example of how we install a module which is going to help us uh, populate the catalog. Uh, so I'm going to pop back to the code window. Uh, I'm going to pop over to the config. So you can see how we've um, got some config here, which is setting up uh, a module to help us populate the catalog. And in this case, this is configured to point at github.com. It's going to crawl the backstage organization, and it's going to populate the catalog with the users and groups from the backstage org in GitHub. So how do I set up the module? Well, I just need to install it. So I'm just going to go to yarn, add, uh, nope, backstage. Plugin catalog backend module GitHub org. 
great. Got there eventually. So this is going to go and add the module. It's going to add it to the package JSON in the back end. And then what we're going to do is hopefully it's going to restart the back end. Yes, it has done. Uh, and it's picked up our new module in here. As you can see, detected catalog backend module GitHub org. Uh, if I now go back to here and give this a refresh, I am hoping that now we have users and groups in the catalog. Great. So these are all the users and groups pulled from um, GitHub and added into the catalog. And that's it. That's all I've got for a demo. Oops, sorry. You know, oh, it's all good. Oh, nice. excellent. Cool. Um, sorry, the backend system demo. <laughs> and now I'm going to talk about the roadmap for the new backend system. Uh, so next up is the 1.0 release. Uh, there's going to be a, well, we're going to need to do a review of all of our API surfaces and uh, polish and refactor as needed. In general, though, we're not aiming for any new features. This is work that's expected to start in roughly a month and take a couple of months to complete. We will, of course, also aim uh, to phase out the usage and support uh, of the existing system, although that's going to be somewhat gradual. Uh, gradual. It's mostly up to each plugin uh, to decide whether they support the old system or not. And we're also going to see an increasing number of plugins that only support the new system. Overall, though, uh, we're expecting to, uh, support to be phased out after the 1.0 release and to have a fully uh, 1.0 release of the backend system uh, and have uh, fully removed support for the old system by the end of the year. Now, just looking a little bit further into the future, I want to highlight another goal that we have in sight, which are dynamic features. Even with declarative integration and all of the improvements that we've been talking about, you still have to rebuild your backstage project when installing new features. For example, if you're deploying with Docker, every time you want to install a new feature, you need to add the dependency, rebuild the image, and redeploy. We want to add support for dynamic features directly into the backstage framework and ecosystem itself. The goal is to be able to install new features directly into your backstage deployment without rebuilding the project. This will really improve the simplicity of man managing a backstage instance and lower the barrier of entry. But we also see it as a tool to help scale large uh, backstage uh, deployments as well, making it possible to deploy plugins separately from the main backstage deployment and integrate them at runtime, even for the front end. This enables individual teams to own the lifecycle of their own plugins and remove the need for a huge monorepo. Now, this work is, of course, dependent on declarative integration and the new front-end and back-end system, but we're already seeing some exciting uh, development uh, in the area. It's work that's already been going on for quite a while with lots of contributions, in particular from Red Hat, and I'd encourage you to watch uh, yesterday's lightning talk, by, uh, lightning talk on the topic by Tom Kufal from uh, Red Hat. I also want, uh, if you want to follow along, we're iterating on the design of uh, this uh, system for front-end plugins in BEP number two. And that's all we had for you today. Thank you. Uh, we do have time for some questions if anyone does have any questions. I don't really know how we're going to do it. There's a microphone there. I can run around maybe. Let's do that. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Thanks the great presentation uh, to Patrick and Ben. Shannon, Patrick. <laughs> so I'd love to ask, um, are you, you mentioned front-end alpha, right, in your roadmap. Yep. And uh, we have been using Backstage like three years for now. And uh, I'm really looking forward to some improvements in terms of front-end because usually our developers, they complain mostly about how UX and UI do not allow them to actually <laughs> to understand sometimes what is happening. And uh, for us, uh, as an infra team, it's hard to actually implement what we want because of the limitations you have. So I would love to hear how you want to address it in your roadmap. It's an area we're excited to work more on once we got the new backend system out, because that's going to free up, you know, headspace. And there's a lot going on in the project. Getting the backend system out and having that more stable lets us really focus more on the front-end system, both, you know, the overall framework and also building uh, front-end plugins. Okay, but is it between this year or we should expect it next year then? One of those two. <laughs> <laughs> I, I 
Yes, sorry. Well managed. <laughs> Hi, uh, just very quickly about operating at scale. We've got about 15,000 engineers in our organization. I know Spotify is maybe not quite that no, big, but still quite a lot of engineers. Yep. What's your sort of expectation for organizations that would deploy to that sort of scale? Like, have you got any good models or documentation about how we should organize and size the teams to actually just run and manage backstage for us? That's an interesting question. I know that we have some blog posts and stuff around that, how we are set up internally at Spotify. I'm guessing when you mean scale, you mean like people power and like t teams contributing to backstage rather than the actual scale of like scaling on Kubernetes, for instance. Like it, it, It's less the scaling on Kubernetes and more just like solving the problem of not only do we have 15,000 engineers, yeah. we've got like tens of thousands of repositories and all of them are different. Yes. All special snowflakes. So yeah. it's not just a we can solve, we can, we can onboard one and all the rest are the same. So that's going to require some help, you know, guiding developers through onboarding stuff. And mm. it's, it's like DevRel in a sort of weird way. Yeah. Right. It's it's tricky. Backstage has a lot of different tools that you can use to solve different pro problems in an organization. Um, some tools are better for solving problems that you have for your organization right now. If it's very, you know, different across the organization, you might want to focus on something like the catalog first, getting kind of control and man like tracking everything, rather than something like the scaffolder, perhaps. Yeah. Or the other way around. Yeah. Really I mean, it's, um, so at what stage? Are, here's a backup question. Uno reverse card. Um, what stage are you, have you adopted backstage yet, or are you looking at? It? Is it like? It is. We are in the midst of sort of planning versus okay. scoping out. Sure. Yeah, I mean, one thing that we recommend to a lot of adopters is like, don't try and solve everything at once. Yeah. Like, try and pick something super isolated that you can go and fix, solve that problem, prove yeah. that it works, and really out more gradually. It might be maybe different, you know, per, or, per adopter, per organization. But yeah, I think yeah, it's tricky, I think, to get yeah. kind of set up at that scale as well. But that's very important. Start small. Start small. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Cool. Thanks for the new backend system. <laughs> basically just not been massively enjoying working in TypeScript on its own, but, <laughs> but just generally with a lot of like the, the stuff. Um, when you're managing plugins and things of like front end back and stuff, um, maybe it's just my dislike of NPM and, and JavaScript TypeScript ecosystem, uh, and like managing all the different plugins. Do you have personal recommendations of like, like you're doing with the community plugin, you're sticking that in a separate repo? We have a bunch of custom plugins um, that we'd be using to do for our own customizations. Do you have your own recommendations of how to manage that stuff in different repos and building them and then integrating them? Other than obviously the magical, lovely new backend system that means I don't operate well. So where we're really hoping to see improvement there is dynamic features later yeah. on and being able to deploy from a separate repo into the main backstage deployment yeah. uh, without having to kind of go and integrate and redeploy. Um, I'm assuming as part of that bet, the uh, <coughs> security of like not just dynamically injecting things into containers is terrifying. Yep, yep. Cool. <laughs> I'll look forward to yes. reading that. <laughs> no worries. Hi. Um, so I think I'm similar to other people in the room where we run a backstage team, we've been doing it for over a year, um, and now we have tons of people within my company who want to contribute custom. Plugin. So I'm seeing the dynamic declarative extension work, and I'm like, oh, this could simplify my code base. I could have other teams have full control over their plugins, and that way we don't have to manage it. And you know, I can see a really nice relationship where people want to develop custom plugins. A question I have is, how does integration testing work in that type of environment? So if I'm loading in all of these um, dynamic plugins that are hitting my backstage, how do I make sure the quality is there as people are developing and pushing updates to their plugins? How do I manage that from a team point of view um, to internal contributors outside of my backstage team? What we're really aiming for is to isolate errors so that if someone's plugin breaks, only their plugin breaks. That's kind of a high priority for that. And then it's up to them to make sure that their plugin is well integrated and works. Okay. I'm looking forward to knowing more about that and maybe some of these declarative extension points 
encapsulate testing or ways that I can have guarantees into the dynamic plugins that I'm using. Because yeah. um, I, I would say that debugging plugins is what my team spends the majority of our time doing, for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have run out of time, I believe. If you have a question, you, you, one, is it one more? Last one. Okay, last one. Last. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's quite quick one. So okay. It's fine. Um, just a new backend system as well. Like a couple of people uh, asking questions there about that. Uh, is it possible to inject um, custom dependencies into plugins with this way? From the boilerplate, I saw it didn't look like you had anything like that. Because I have like uh, specifically like a metrics that I like to inject into the dependencies that the plugins require. So we got modules for extending plugins uh, themselves. The plugins export extension points that you can use to customize functionality that's specific to the plugin. Then we got the services, which are the framework level kind of features for all, basically everything, the routing, logging, uh, all the different kind of base play things. And you can override those, and you can customize the functionality of those per plugin as well, uh, if you want to. Yes. Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you.